Welcome to the Singapore Management University podcast series, where we feature the latest insights and perspectives from our faculty. The earliest cryptocurrency, a kind of virtual or digital currency, emerged as far back as the early 1990s. However, most of them are long gone. Today, there are more than 300 to 400 kinds of virtual currency in the market, with an array of odd names like Feathercoin, Firefly Coin, and Zeus Coin. Critics often highlight that a virtual currency is backed by nothing, like gold or a national government, and therefore has no intrinsic value. Yet, such currencies continue to grow in popularity. In fact, advocates are confident that virtual currency serves an important purpose and is here to stay. The growth in cryptocurrency challenges established institutions such as central banks, exchanges and governments and can potentially change the way businesses are conducted around the world. David Lee is the Academic Director of the Sim Kee Boon Institute for Financial Economics at SMU and a Professor of Quantitative Finance at the SMU Lee Kong Chien School of Business. His institute has been involved in digital currency research since 2013 and he is presently writing a book on cryptocurrency scheduled for release next year. In this podcast, Professor Lee shares with us his insights on the development of cryptocurrency, its global impact, as well as its prospects going forward. Professor, by definition, cryptocurrency is a digital or virtual currency that uses cryptography for security. For the uninitiated among us, could you explain more about what it is and why is it important for people to learn more about it? Uh, cryptocurrency started with DigiCash Incorporated in 1990. Payments were transferred online and offline using cryptography protocols that protect the privacy of the users. The first cryptocurrency created in the e-cash system exists in various banks, cash and smart cards in the US and Finland. It slowly evolved into the current form of cryptocurrencies with many refinements by various software developers over the last 20 years. E-cash was a centralized system owned by the company DigiCash and later eCash Incorporated. And after it was acquired by Infospace in 1990, cryptocurrency faded into the background. Then we had the global financial crisis in 2008 and the interest was revived. Cryptocurrencies is designed to counter a few problems associated with the fiat currency system. Since we abandoned the gold standard in 1971, and adopted the fiat currency system, central banks have used their discretion to print as much as they desired during a crisis. The supply of cryptocurrency or coins may or may not be limited, but the new coins are usually created at a predetermined rate. So, the loss of trust in the fiat currency system, caused mainly by quantitative easing and huge government debts has brought attention to cryptocurrency for those who wanted to hedge their positions. This was again demonstrated in the 2013 Cyprus property-related banking crisis, where levy was imposed on bank deposits, causing many to convert their fiat money into cryptocurrencies. So, what is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency in its purest form is a peer-to-peer version of electronic cash. It allows online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. The network timestamps the transactions using cryptography proof of work, which is basically a contest for decoding. The first to crack the code will be rewarded with the newly created coins. This contest will form a record of the transactions that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. Cryptocurrency is a subclass of virtual or digital currency. And there are many types of digital currency. Examples are air mouse issued by the airlines, game tokens for computer games and online casinos, Brixton Pound to be spent only in the Brixton local community in the Greater London area, and in many other forms that can exchange for virtual and physical objects in a closed system and in the case of an open system in exchange for fiat currency. Many of these that I mentioned do not belong to the class of cryptocurrency. Could you give an example of a particular cryptocurrency? 
Satoshi Nakamoto published a paper on the web in 2008 for a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Despite many efforts, the identity of Satoshi remains unknown to the public, and we don't know whether Satoshi is a group or a person. Satoshi invented one particular form of cryptocurrency called Bitcoin that is run by open source software. It can be downloaded by anyone, and the system runs on a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer network. It is not only decentralized, but supposedly fully distributed. That means that every node or computer terminal is connected to each other. Every node can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work known as the blockchain as a record accepted by most. This longest blockchain is a proof of what happened while they were gone. Why is there so much interest on cryptocurrency among researchers, regulators, investors and merchants? Cryptocurrency is uh, mysterious and misunderstood for a few reasons. First, no one knows who is really behind some of these cryptocurrency systems. It was designed so that third-party trust is not needed and sometimes there's no legal entity behind it, but open source software. It is a mystery. Secondly, many have jokingly mentioned that for Bitcoin, it sounded like Bitcoin, especially after the collapse of Mt. Gox. But Mt. Gox was a financial intermediary. It was just one of many unregulated exchanges that trade Bitcoins and not the Bitcoin system itself. It is a complex currency system to the men in the street, and there lies the confusion. Thirdly, cryptocurrency involves mining or proof of work. There are rewards for mining, and the reward is given to the first who can solve uh, the problem of cryptography. Cryptocurrency cleverly solved the double spending problem so that every cryptocurrency can be spent only once. It is financial technology and it involves uh, financial regulation. There lies the difficulty in execution and understanding even for the professionals. That's why it is an area of great interest to researchers, regulators, investors, merchants, and it is hitting the headlines regularly. It certainly changes the way we think about money. What are the advantages of cryptocurrency over traditional money? Each cryptocurrency is a great and an interesting experiment. No one knows where these cryptocurrency experiments are heading, but the experiments are interesting, mainly because of the technology associated with it. The technology disrupts the payment system because it costs almost nothing to transfer payments. It reaches out to the unbanked and the underbanked. It presents the opportunity to function as a conduit for payments as well as for raising funds. It will transform the way business is being done by diminishing the role of middlemen, whether it is smart accounting or smart contract. It will change the way financial world operates, especially in fundraising and lending. Basically, it is possible to do an initial crowd offering or crowd lending, or in the peer-to-peer -peer framework, eliminating the middlemen. Any downside to using this sort of currency? There are four disadvantages or downside to cryptocurrency. The first one is the reliability of the blockchain. If there are any doubts about the reliability of the blockchain, then the interest will wane because you cannot accurately reflect who is owning which Bitcoin and where they are on the digital register. And all the transactions will then be messed up. Secondly, for any coins to be of interest to merchant, of interest to the miners, uh, more important for the miners is that they are rewarded by mining. So if the, the cryptocurrency is being issued too quickly and too many of them are being exhausted in the early life of the cryptocurrency, then the incentive for the miners will reduce as the time goes on. That will lead to fewer people mining and when fewer people mining, again, um, you will have a situation where the blockchain may not accurately reflect uh, the true register. Once the mining uh, game is not as interesting, you have to find other ways to reward them where there are no new coins created. And that comes to transaction fee. You have to pay them a transaction fee to keep their computer terminal on. 
in order for this register to be kept. But if the transaction fee being charged is too high uh, or unreasonable, then the merchants will start to drop out because it's, it makes no economic sense for them to use this payment system. In that case, the price of the coin will drop and the minor reward will also drop. So more miners will drop out again will lead to the same problem of not enough people safeguarding the accuracy of the blockchain. Finally, our research at Simkipo Institute has shown that if the cost of the mining equipment or the cost of the electricity for mining becomes too high, we have a situation where the man in the street who tries to mine will all join a mining pool. When too many people join a few mining pools, we have the same situation where a small group of people are controlling the whole mining process. And then that again will cast doubts on the accuracy of the blockchain. So those are the major downsides of uh, cryptocurrency that we really have to watch carefully and closely. Professor, what kind of impact are we seeing as a result of this digital currency revolution? There will be a lot of impact on the digital and physical world. Let me give a couple of examples. A lot of devices will be connected to each other via near few communication or, in short, NFC. Whatever devices that are carried by our side or are worn on our body will contain information about our preferences, possibly our current state of health and most likely all our personal records, including how much money we have. We may not need to carry physical wallets and identity cards anymore. These devices will monitor us and improve our experience in every aspect of our life, including medical care, education and financial services. The blockchain technology can play a major role in lowering the cost of financial services via cost sharing through mining and therefore financial institutions can reach out to the unbanked and underbanked as well as those that require lending and fundraising. Financial services, especially banking, will likely be disrupted and the margin will be affected as what eCash was set out to do in the early 1990s. Another example is the use of smart contracts for a sharing economy. We will be able to share our assets such as cars, hard disks, computer memory that we don't use and rent them out to others for a fee. Infrastructure need not increase but access capacity is used efficiently. There is also the possibility of time banking so that the cryptocurrency is stored in hours of work. One can then trade with the time spent in say palliative care when one is young and then the same person will be entitled to such care when he or she gets older with the hours that have been deposited at the time bank. In other words, cryptocurrency may not replace the fiat currency, but its blockchain technology will certainly have an impact on the welfare of the people and perhaps even out the inequality. We have seen many virtual currencies come and go, and as you were talking about Bitcoin, it is the first virtual currency to show true potential, and it seems rather resilient and is the dominant virtual currency right now. What makes it successful? There is always first mover advantage, and certainly Bitcoin has emerged as the leading cryptocurrency with estimated 6 million el electronic wallets, 70,000 merchants, and a market capitalization of about 5 billion US dollars. For the past six months, there are 50 to 80,000 transactions daily, approximately 50 million US dollars or over 110,000 bitcoins are traded daily. Bitcoin has been successful so far and an ecosystem is up to support its existence. A successful digital currency must be able to ride on its initial success and leverage on the network effect. Bitcoin is subject to the same problems we mentioned earlier. Our own research in SKBI has shown that as the mining costs go up because equipment becomes more expensive, mining pool will be formed as miners are usually risk averse and want better odds in winning the race. This increases the possibility of an attack or the emergence of a gold finger that determines to cause problems for the whole currency system. There are slightly over 13.4 million bitcoins in circulation at the moment. 25 bitcoins are created approximately every 10 minutes now, and the number of new coins created will have half every four years. As soon as the full supply of 21 million bitcoins are issued by the year 
2040, which is still very distant, the risk of miners dropping out may increase. If the only reward is transaction fees and if the fees become too high, the merchants will drop out. Of course, there are technical solutions to all this and some cryptocurrencies have come up with the idea of proof of stake, reducing the probability that any single person can use a quantum computer to override the whole system. There are also attempts to lower the cost of mining so as to reduce the so-called 51% attack problems. However, there is still no foolproof solution to the gold finger issue that if anyone, if enough financial strength, wishes to mess up the record, he or she can do so in theory. There are also coins that are looking into proof of identity to reduce the possibility of using the currency for money laundering or terrorism activities. As long as the coin admits that the government is part of the ecosystem and the community work hand in hand to create the ecosystem, it will popularize the usage. A coin that addresses those issues that I mentioned above will have a bright future. What's your take, Professor, on its prospects and the role it will play in future society? What I'm seeing is that for once in our history, technology is playing a very major part in finance. In future, a bank is not a bank unless it is a digital or technology bank. I see a lot of similarities between hedge fund and cryptocurrency. When hedge funds were in its infant stage, it was perceived to be disruptive to currency system because hedge fund managers were the really bad guys that took big bets. Some banks do not want to deal with them. Startups in cryptocurrency face the same problems today. There are a lot of bad press, headline news, misunderstandings, and some banks are unwilling to open accounts with them because of various reasons. Regulators are uncomfortable at the moment to deal with a complex financial innovation, and their resistance and reluctance to learn about the intricacies of an innovation by the main street. It is a wait and see situation. That is human nature and is always the universities and those who are interested in the technology that will see the opportunities. If Bitcoin loses its popularity for whatever reasons, a new cryptocurrency will emerge to replace it with better features than Bitcoin. Countries with huge debts have the incentive to create their own cryptocurrency and those who wish to promote financial integration may also turn to cryptocurrency. Eventually, it is about reduction of business costs. Welfare improvement will follow for those at the bottom of the wealth pyramid and it will lead to enhanced efficiency in the sharing economy. I remain positive on the development of cryptocurrency because of the blockchain technology. We will see a lot of uncertainties and ups and downs in the cryptocurrency world. It may or may not be the next big thing, but it is the technology that financial institutions cannot ignore. Thank you very much, Professor, for a very insightful interview. Thank you. Thank you.